So welcome back everyone to this uh, round table dedicated to the work of Konstantin Floros, who is hopefully, hopefully following from his home in Hamburg. Um, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, we thought we would uh, read first Floros' text aloud um, and then um, uh, Petri Lorant and um, Erotarasti will um, read their own um, ideas, uh, what they have prepared about Floros, and then uh, I will close and will open the dialogue for you to, to say uh, whatever you feel like saying. So this is um, Professor Floros' text that he sent extra for this session. Uh, the title is uh, humane, humane Music and Semantic Analysis. What is music and what can it do? Whereof consists its value? These questions are repeatedly asked, but they are answered in different ways, evidently in accordance with one's epistemological position. In my opinion, in Floros' opinion, Music is no mere sound play, no mere acoustic stimulus, and no mere kaleidoscope of tones, but an art with a significant anthropological reference. As a vivid utterance of the human being, it has a human and a humane substratum. It is made by people and often is dedicated to people. And it is above all designed for people. It basically has a psychological, spiritual, and social depth dimension. Many, moreover, believe that art is embedded in life to fulfill a variety of functions in a social-cultural network. In my view, music always has to do with human experience. It copies not everyday reality, but the verity of human beings as such, including thus the absurd, the crazy, the mannered, the realm of dreams, the complete human cosmos, in which the imagination constitutes a highly relevant domain. Composers write their works for themselves, for a client, for people with whom they are in a relationship, for the general public or for posterity. Many composers have specific intentions, send out messages, wish to accomplish something with their music. The task then is gently to bring these intentions to light. The legends of Greek antiquity ascribe a magical power to music, a preternatural effect. The quintessence of the Orpheus myth is the belief that music can enchant not only the human being, but all of nature, every living thing. The singing of Orpheus tames the wild animals, casts a spell on plants and trees, and overcomes the dark monsters of the underworld. His music can melt even stones. If one scans the musicology of the last seven or eight decades, one is confronted with numerous directions, tendencies, and trends. One thing, however, seems to be typical of nearly all of them, the will to abstraction, the endeavor to study the works of art in and for themselves, searching for certain higher inherent laws. In the process, the artist, him or herself, is often pushed to the periphery of the view. In time, it became fashionable to speak with contempt, or at least condescension, of biographism and content aesthetics. In his book, Menschliches, Allzu Menschliches, Friedrich Nietzsche, who we know had a special relationship to music, writes, I quote, individuals who have lagged behind in their musical development 
can experience the same composition purely formalistically, where the musically advanced will understand everything symbolically. End of quote. That wise observation could serve as a motto to any treatise about musical semantics. The fundamental question concerning the relationship between language, language and music is still a subject of vehement controversy. While some scholars regard speech and music as wholly different media, others speak of the quasi-linguistic quality of music. They point out that music has a grammar, logic and syntax, as well as a vocabulary, albeit one that is subject to constant change. In the Baroque period, music as tonal language frequently oriented itself in terms of rhetoric. Theoreticians spoke of it as sound speech. And even today, we use syntactic terms when, in analyzing pre-classical and classical compositions, we speak of periods, hauptsatz, nebensatz. In one crucial respect, of course, tonal language differs fundamentally from verbal language. It has no meaning except in a musical context. This point is time and again cited by philosophers as a decisive argument against the quasi-linguistic character of music. It has to be clearly qualified inasmuch as many musicians circumscribe the semantics of their music by diverse means. The psychology of music has long since recognized that low notes are associated with volume and large size, high ones with slenderness and brightness. High and low, loud and soft, shrill and euphonious pertain to the realm of synesthesia, the coupling of physically separate areas of sense perception. Parallel to that, a conventional sound symbolism has evolved since the 16th century. This symbolism is still in part valid in the 19th century. Major and minor are generally known to represent contrary moods. Italian theoreticians link these modes to the distinction between musica allegra and musica mesta, cheerful and sad music. In addition, the sound of specific instruments is associated with extra-musical concepts. The sound of horns reminds us of the hunt, that of trumpets of festivities and demonstrations of power, trombone choruses make us think of funeral scenes, while organ music evokes the ecclesiastical, the religious, the transcendent. Theoretical inquiries of the last several decades have revolutionized the methodology of almost all the sciences of art. It became gradually clear that not only language, but also music, in the final analysis, serves the purpose of communication. In a certain way, both language and music can be defined as communicative systems. A composer can thus be compared to a transmitter who sends a message to a recipient and the way the recipient reacts is fully informative for the sender. In this way, communication occurs between a composer and the listener as it does between an author and his or her reader. These reflections about interaction also make novel demands on analysis, on appreciation, evaluation and judgment. The chief concern of musical analysis has always been to study the structure of a composition. In other words, to find out how it is put together. But it must not be forgotten that not everything in the musical work of art is structure, and that stylistic criticism without content analysis is of little profit. The spirit of a work does not reveal itself only in its technical dimensions, but also in its expression, its unique musical language, in its form of representation, in its alternating characters and in its content, which in many instances means its extra musical message. Music has an important psychological and spiritual dimension 
which requires clarification as much as structure does. One could also put it this way, a musical work of art is in no way a windowless monad, as Adorno says, which one can elucidate only by an imminent procedure from within. Rather, it can also be viewed and illuminated up extra. And the aim of semantic analysis consists not only in bringing art imminent secret programs to light, but in defining the expression of music and the spirit of the work of art objectively and systematically. According to my firm conviction, no musical analysis can be successful if it is pursued only an sich by itself, in isolation from the biography of the artist, detached from his personality and his spiritual intellectual world. A profitable, profitable semantic analysis presupposes several things. To begin with, it requires a clarification of the biographic situation in which the work of art has come about. Many compositions are commissioned to works or were intended for individuals with whom the artist had a personal relationship. Important here are the specific occasion of the work, dedications and dedicates. Equally indispensable are the details of the work's genetic history because they can yield additional insight into the, into the composition besides structure and genesis. In recent years, research on the sketches of Gustav Mahler, Arnold Schoenberg and Arenberg have thus led to sensational results. A thorough knowledge of the intellectual interests of the author, his music aesthetic preconditions, and above all, his intentions, are further requirements for a semantic analysis. It should hardly need emphasizing that the psychological cosmos and the manifold spiritual world of the author are reflected in his oeuvre, from which it would follow of necessity that his, her literary impulses, philosophic insights and religious experiences and or his social engagement should be included in our considerations. But the most important precondition of semantic analysis is the systematic exploration of the composer's musical symbolism. Charging the music with significative content in the 19th and 20th centuries is done by means of quotations from oneself or others, allusions to works by other composers, ideophonic, that is self-sounding instruments and sound symbols, and musical character pieces, such as instrumental recitative and arioso, choral and lead without words, march and funeral march, exequies music, pastoral, lentla, and other dance characters. Composers also semanticize their music by means of numerological games, anagrams, and all kinds of cryptograms. We need to think only of Arbenberg's magic fate number, the 23. If one keeps all of that in view, one will understand what Gustav Mahler meant when he told his confidant, Natalie Bauer-Lechner, as noted in 1896, and I quote, all communication between the composer and the listener rests on the convention that the latter will accept this or that motive or musical symbol, or whatever else one may want to call it, as the expression of this or that idea or actual spiritual content. Everybody will be specially aware of this in Wagner, but Beethoven too, and more or less every other composer, has his special, generally accepted expression for everything he wants to say. But my language, people have not yet entered into. They have no inkling as to what I am saying and what I mean. And it seems sen senseless and incompre incomprehensible to them." End of quote. 
Reception aestheticians point out that the interpretation of works of art is subject to constant change in the course of time. That is certainly so. It is all the more important, therefore, to extract the intention the author, in this case the composer, had in conceiving his work. And as for the history of interpretation, it would have to be measured, not least, by the authorial intention. Notes and scores by Robert Schumann, Hector Berlioz, Richard Wagner, Franz Liszt, Richard Strauss, Gustav Mahler, and Alban Berg cannot be interpreted without the incorporation of semantic questions. The poetic element is present in all of them. The method of semantic analysis developed by me is at the base of almost all of my books. I should mention here my Mahler trilogy, as well as my books about Beethoven's Eroica, about Wolfgang Amade, Mozart, Johannes Brahms, Anton Bruckner, Alban Berg, Jörg Ligeti, and the books Humanism, Love and Music, 2011 in English, German original 2000, Music as Message, English 2016, original German 1989, and Listening and Understanding the Language of Music and How to Interpret It, um, English 2017, original German 2008. So that is uh, Floris's text. <clears throat> So, dear Professor Floros, dear Joan, dear Aero, dear colleagues here, uh, it is a special pleasure uh, to take part in this uh, celebration. And of course, it is very hard to say anything about the beautifully uh, formulated and very rich message uh, from uh, Professor Floros. So let me start uh, with a very personal memory um, 30 years ago, as a secondary school student, I went to the public library of Budapest, the capital of Hungary, just to check uh, the literature on Mahler, which is available on the freely accessible sh uh, uh, shelves of, of the library. And I very much remember, you know, the, the, the shape uh, of, of uh, these as uh, they had uh, the first volume, and that time only the first volume of uh, the biography of Mahler by Henri-Louis de Lagrange, then uh, all the three volumes by Donald uh, Mitchell on uh, Mahler, and uh, the trilogy, as uh, Professor Floros himself formulated, uh, by uh, our uh, celebrated uh, colleague, the three volumes in uh, orange uh, cover. And uh, this should remind us the fact how important uh, uh, were the 1970s in Mahler research, because you remember that two of the volumes by Professor Flores were published uh, in the 70s, uh, two of the three volumes uh, of uh, the, the Mitchell trilogy were also uh, published uh, that uh, time. And well, uh, Lagrange project was a very long project and now it's, uh, it's a fulfilled project with the re-edition of the uh, uh, first volume of the biography. And very obviously, it, it means that the 70s was a kind of uh, uh, foundation in uh, a new foundation, of course, not the first foundation, but a new foundation in modern and, uh, and uh, properly structured knowledge uh, on Mahler. Of course, the approaches of these uh, three pioneers are uh, very uh, uh, differing. Uh, Lagrange uh, was focusing on biography, or I would say a kind of life and work uh, project in a monumental style. Uh, Donald Mitchell's trilogy is a very specific, uh, um, uh, has a very specific genre 
it is a kind of, in a very good sense, a maze of a labyrinth of ideas uh, coming from biography, coming from a philology of Mahler's music, and uh, coming from, uh, from the analysis and uh, uh, interpretation of uh, 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 Mahler's works. And then we have the trilogy by Professor uh, Floros, and we have a very specific approach which uh, leads to a beautiful uh, interpretation of the signification issue of Mahler's music, but it, the starting point is rather different because as I see, as I understand, in, in Professor Floro's work, uh, the personality has a very uh, uh, large um, importance and uh, saying that he is, and he is a humanist, uh, means that, of course, even if you are focusing on works, you cannot forget about the personality behind the works, next to the works, but this personality is somewhere there. And of course, this personality, and in our case, it is uh, Gustav Mahler, has a mind, a very specific mind, and the starting point for Professor Floros is a very nuanced uh, reconstruction of the cultural, philosophical, uh, social, political uh, ideas within this mind. And we don't have to forget that uh, uh, this task was uh, fulfilled uh, by a scholar uh, who had uh, a very uh, rich educational background apart from, from his musicological uh, background. So he was really prepared for, for these tasks to deal with, uh, uh, for example, uh, with the philosophical background of Mahler, which is a very important uh, issue in, in the case of uh, this uh, composer. But then with this background, uh, Floros arrives to the work and what he actually does in this uh, trilogy and then later volumes uh, dedicated uh, uh, to uh, Mahler's uh, work and life. So what he does is a very systematic um, analysis of the uh, uh, signification in Mahler's music and the result is a typology and a topos theory and a genre-oriented uh, uh, approach to Mahler's music where we still have the personality somewhere, <laughs> but it is more important that works are in communication with other works Mahler works with other works by Mahler, Mahler's works with composers before him and after him. So we have um, analysis of intertextuality, but not without uh, channels. Channels are genres like marches, like the Landler already uh, uh, mentioned in uh, uh, Flora's uh, message. And uh, then we have the topics, uh, the pastoral topics and, and other topics. And uh, it is very important that uh, those musical types or topics which are um, identified by Floros are rather specific. And, and if you realize the connection he establishes between composers and periods, it's, it's really amazing. So let me just mention one uh, example. I mentioned marches, and of course it's, it's almost a, a common place about Mahler that his music quotes or refers to march music, marching music, or uh, uh, military band music in very, various cases. But uh, to understand the kind of approach uh, uh, Floros uh, professed, uh, let me uh, tell you this example. He has a chapter on marches coming from far away, arriving 
to the present uh, stage of the music. So March is uh, making a kind of crescendo and possibly afterwards a diminuendo, and in this way expressing uh, the, the movement, the moving of, let's say, a military band or an other marching company of people from far away uh, to here and then back again somewhere far away. And when he identifies this topic, uh, he finds examples from 18th century French opera uh, through Mozart till Mahler and then towards uh, 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 Bizet and, and Debussy. And uh, the entire line is, is beautiful. It's absolutely fascinating. And uh, if, if you check the, the actual composers, you can also reconstruct uh, the cultural uh, connections between at least uh, 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 some of them. So at this point, certainly, you arrive to a kind of very refined topos theory from uh, the start, which was you know, the reconstruction of the mind, of, of uh, uh, the content of the mind of, of, of the composer. Professor Flores mentioned Adorno. One of the scholars, the Mahler scholars, uh, preceded this generation of uh, uh, um, um, uh, Michel Lagrange, uh, Flores himself, and others. And uh, I think it, it is important that, that he, he mentioned Adorno, because in many ways, um, his uh, Mahlerian theory of music signification is a kind of debate uh, with Adorno, is a kind of argument or uh, ex expression of doubts about certain ideas of uh, Adorno's very powerful and, and influential book and essays on Mahler. To me, the two approaches are uh, equally important because I believe that uh, Adorno was dealing with, uh, let's say, the ontology and the behavior of Mahler's music, which is sometimes very close to the issues of signification, but of course different. But it is a different way. And then we have another way about music signification as represented by Floros uh, studies. And I think that these ways are uh, meeting at a certain point, and uh, it is, uh, we can be uh, very grateful for uh, this uh, rich um, musicological uh, heritage, living uh, heritage in Mahler research and uh, in uh, music signification. Thanks so much, Laurent. Uh, now, Professor Tarasti. So, can you hear me? Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Very um, exciting. Of course, this Professor Flores is very remarkable paper, which we just heard with a great humanist message to all of us. It was wonderful. And just your analysis of the, which evoked many many interesting connections with Mahler studies, um, also with Adorno, we all know. Uh, my knowledge about Floros is uh, mostly based um, in literary sense in that uh, trilogy of the, which I have read a lot, and which I just borrowed <laughs> once again from the library in Helsinki before I left here. So, so uh, that might be a bit old fashioned because in the speech we heard and what, what you said, uh, there are also English translations nowadays. So, so I mostly have, have linked um, um, uh, Floros to the, just a German speaking word and German mu musicology. But there might be nowadays English translations. Uh, I have met, we have met him uh, several times in these musical signification conferences. I think in Krakow he was present, yes. uh, certainly. And then the last time we met him with Ayla was in uh, Vienna. There was a congress on Musik als Nachricht, arranged by Professor Hartmut Krones, from our colleague from Vienna Conservatory. So he was there, his wife, and we heard his, his speech. 
Uh, by the way, one of his speeches, I remember always, was entitled, Warum Mahler so geliebt ist. So why, why Mahler is so, so much liked or loved as a composer. Yet, um, thinking of Constantine Floros in the context of uh, musical signification, he occupies a very uh, central position in the field of musical semiotics, or say it more broadly, musical signification, and traditional historical musicology, as well as in hermeneutic philosophy. Because he is a bridge among them, uniting epistemic areas which would otherwise seem to be separated from each other. So he is somehow between the strictly semiotic approach and the hermeneutic uh, traditional German. So uh, he is a bridge. And so that's why he has a very important role uh, in the development of, of our, our, um, um, our uh, semiotic approach. And in the light of my existential semiotics, uh, it's analogous when we try to combine continental philosophy and the classical semiotics. However, um, Floros does not use the term semiotics almost anywhere. Um, the only mention I found in, in that um, Mahler trilogy uh, is a footnote in Mahler 2, in chapter Das Symbol in der Musik zur Begriffserklärung, page 189. Um, but here we can note in general that semiotics, with a, which has a rather strong Franco-Italian or Anglo-American identity, um, has never been in Germany a major stream of anything. So not to ignore some very remarkable achievements in Persian, uh, oriented semiotics and linguistics. Uh, remember my colleague, our colleague, uh, passed away, Roland Posner, for instance, and um, uh, Walter uh, Koch in Bochum, and um, Klaus Oehler, and, and some, uh, some um, uh, German um, tradition. But, but for them, uh, it's strange that they were very, very American-oriented. For them, semiotics was the same as Peirce. Mm -hmm. And I always say that, why don't you consider your own rich German uh, Geistesgeschichtliche Tradition? From, uh, but when I said so, then, Paul said, well, Hegel is a conceptual poetry, so he's not to be taken serious at all. Anyway, Hegel, certainly for Adorno, it's the basis. You can't, can't even read Adorno without Hegel, to my mind. But now, um, um, but we, uh, we are now delighted to discover a scholar, Floros, who seems to be, uh, at least implicitly, a semiotician of music. Um, Although in the German language, as I said, the publications are rather rare. Mutton the publishes only in English. It's funny, because they think that there's no market in German uh, studies at all. Um, so it is not a surprise that Floros's reasoning takes place in German and, and um, makes references to German literature. Now, one of the rare books in Germany uh, in the field of semiotics is by Vladimir Garbuzitsky. He is a Grundriss der Musikalischen Semantik whom we know. Um, and he comes rather close with his reference to, on musical symbols to Floros, to my mind. For Floros, uh, music is essentially transmission of what he calls Sinngehalt. So um, sense content, I don't know how to say Sinngehalt. So meaningful contents. Um, and in this sense, albeit his main topics has been Mahler symphonies, he considered the so-called absolute music a myth. We know this truth since Beethoven, as you know, remember, he accepted right uh, literary programs for all his uh, piano sonatas, invited by Karl Czerny. Uh, he accepted it, Beethoven, really. But then he, he refused, after all. He, he resigned, because he thought that he cannot uh, <laughs> write those concrete narrative programs, uh, after all, for his sonatas. Um, no, moreover, of course, in the German field, we have, um, we still carry some um, impact of, from um, um, Ernst Kassirer, his Philosophie der Symbolischen Formen, and thereafter, of course, Susan Langer in the United States, um, his pupil. Floros gives three definitions uh, of the notion of symbol, page 188-99, um, namely, first, symbol should not be confused with uh, style idiomatic expressions such as stereotype forms are, with, are in Mahler no symbols. Characteristic turns and returns of motives are not necessarily symbolic. That's what Kovoros said in his theory. But maybe he has changed his mind, I don't know. Um, because, of course, we could think that uh, uh, 
such symbols, they are, they are inner symbols, which, which they are purely musical. They, they, they are not outer, outer symbols referring outside, but they are inner within, within the musical process. Second, for Floros, um, uh, symbol is involved only when it transmits a Sinngehalt, sense content. So symbol is not any sign in music, like calls or signals. Uh, so no pictorialism, no tone, tone painting or tone malerai is symbolic to his mind. That was his second. Third, essential moment is the consciousness. Musical sign is a symbol only if a composer uses it consciously and intentionally. So symbols are in no case subjective cognition of a performer or listener, but what is involved is thus the work of the composer. So he, he keeps that rather, rather strict opinion. And um, uh, in his Mahler study number three, Floros quotes Mahler's own interpretation of uh, Mahler's third symphony. So Mahler uh, said himself, Abe symphony heist mir eben, mit allen mitten der vorhandenen Technik eine Welt aufbauen. So eine Welt aufbauen mit, mit musical means. Now, in this field of musical hermeneutics, um, uh, rather than semiotics, we encounter uh, such scholars like um, uh, as Arnold Schering, uh, which uh, I think for us does not <laughs> accept, but Schering, of course, was powerful with his, um, let's say, Beethoven und die Richtung and, and other hermeneutic studies. Um, Floros mentions um, sharing in reference um, to a Finnish music scholar, Nies Erik Ringboom, who published in 1955 a study, Über die Deutbarkeit der Tonkunst. So and Ringboom strongly rejected, namely, the sh sh Scheringian hermeneutics. Deutbarkeit is a very difficult term to be translated. I don't know how it's in English. Deuten is certainly uh, to indicate, to indicate something, that's Deuten. So Deutbarkeit is the possibility to indicate something, something concrete. Um, well, for Karbuzitsky, the central notion of semiotics was the Persian index. But this index is not perhaps the same as Deuten or Deutung. Yet Floros, in turn, rejects Ringboom's idea <laughs> that symbols, symbols can manifest also unconscious meaning, which can be irrational. But as I said, this is from a Mahler study. He maybe have changed his opinion um, later. So, now in this context, it would be tempting to compare um, the Mahlerian vision of symphony with um, other symphonists of the period. Um, I, I want to mention here the name of Jean Sibelius. Sibelius is never mentioned by Floros in any of his studies, to my mind. Even in the list of those um, marginal composers like Tchaikovsky and others, he does not uh, even put Sibelius there. So he it, it just non-existing, and however, this interesting opposition, Sibelius Mahler, is one of the most uh, fascinating uh, controversies in the music history of the 20th century. Um, well, uh, Ringboom again uh, criticizes um, such Sibelius studies which bring his symphonies closer to hermeneutic views, like those represented by, by Mahler. We have, uh, by Ilmari Kroon, um, Professor of Musicology in Helsinki, uh, their study, Der Stimmungsgehalt von Sibelius Symphonien, which he published in uh, two volumes in 1947, I, I think, uh, and in which he tried to uh, bring back Sibelius to the leitmotif uh, re reading and, and quite concrete uh, hermetic programs like first symphony was the Kullerva uh, von Kalevala, second one was Finland's fight for independence, and etc. But, but of course, Sibelius himself totally rejected this. Sibelius said, I, I must quote here, that uh, he says that, Ich bin kein literarischer Musiker. Für mich fängt die Musik dort an, wo das Wort aufhört. Eine Symphony soll zuerst und zuletzt Musik sein. So this is very different from, from Mahler, what we said, but it's um, fascinating. Um, well, um, of course, then we have Adorno, <laughs> who, who was completely negative about Sibelius, and he wrote his terrible glossary about Sibelius in 1937 in London as a refugee. But, and Adorno has had both political, political and musical reasons. He simply couldn't understand Sibelius' music as a discourse at all. That was the first, but, but also was political issue there. But um, 
Let me tell you just to, to conclude uh, because they, these composers, they met each other once in 1907. Then the Mahler came to Helsinki to, to um, conduct the Philharmonic Orchestra. But um, he, his life situation was very difficult because I think his daughter had passed away and he was uh, fired from Vienna Opera uh, as a uh, conductor after many intrigues. So he was in a very bad, bad mood when coming to Helsinki. And um, um, he had never heard about Sibelius except uh, while stressed and, um, and uh, spring song, which is an orchestral piece, but uh, nothing of his symphonies. So they met each other, and of course Mahler said his view on symphony. The symphony must, must alles umfassen, the ganze Welt must, must man in symphony stellen, he said. But Sibelius thought that symphony is profound inner logic of musical processes without any external references. Now then the um, discussion continued, and Mahler asked, uh, <laughs> quite innocently as a musician, because he was conductor at the uh, which pieces of yours would you like, Sibelius, that um, I, will, I will conduct in uh, Central Europe? And then Sibelius answered, nothing. Which was <laughs> rather, I would say, typical Finnish inferiority complex. <laughs> because, but he didn't understand that uh, it was just a musician's ask. And, um, well, if he had said, yes, take that one, then it might have been quite, quite different. But what remained from this, from this um, visit to Helsinki about Mahler is the wonderful, the best portrait we have of him, named, painted by actually Galle and Kallela in the Vitresk um, manner um, in the side of Helsinki, which, um, where Mahler was brought by actually Galle and Kallela. And, and um, you remember that portrait in which he, he is sitting at a fireplace and the, um, the fire is reflected in his, in his face. So it's, uh, uh, this is now kept in, in Tampere, in Manta Gallery, but I saw it in Louvre once in Mahler exhibition, so, so it's remarkable. But that's the only thing which remained. <laughs> no, anyway, I want to tell you, maybe um, uh, Professor Flores would not like at all that we take Sibelius in this context, but, um, but uh, as I said, Flores is fascinating and really great European uh, continental uh, music philosopher somehow, and, and um, and um, absolutely admirable in, with his, all his studies, I think. So, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for using my cell phone during the round table like a cheeky young student. The thing is, uh, I, I, I wasn't checking my Instagram. I was uh, trying to make sure that Professor Floros is on, online listening to this. Um, I think he is. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Airo. Thank you very much, Laurent. Um, I remember I was a student in Vienna as I got to know Professor Floros' books on Mahler, later on Brahms and Mozart, Berg, Bruckner. Since there were no emails or smartphones back then, it took me a long time <clears throat> to find the courage to write to him and ask him for a meeting in Hamburg, his adoptive home. He was as friendly and generous as if we were family from the very start. And indeed, we share Mediterranean uh, roots and uh, Germanic education, especially in Vienna. Being a Greek in Central and Northern Europe must be a unique experience. Imagine just how relevant the Greek culture is for all of us Westerners. Floros is a wise man, a humanist. He's a musicologist who has contributed decisively to musical signification or music semantics in his own terms. Or music semiotics, we could say, in Eros terms. He started to publish in the 1960s, can you imagine? And he has not grown tired of repeating that musical meaning 
takes music back to humanities where it belongs. It seems only the first half of the 20th century, or maybe just both world wars, have brought about this confusing disconnection from a tradition that reaches back to the very origins of our history, to our Greek origins. Within this tradition, music allows for a linguistic and for a mathematical point of view. Professor Floros, in his condition of a humanist, well-founded in philosophy and psychology, but also in musical performance, yes, was one of the happy few who were capable of this pioneer task. The musicological world back in the second half of the 20th century was not always ready to receive adequately his message about music's expressive qualities. The formalist dogma that declares that music is nothing but abstract structures with no relationship to the human realities kept Floris's work away from the focus he deserved. His answer was an enormous effort of erudition held strenuously for decades. It is a peaceful response made of logos and reflection using the art of persuasion that has helped us to think since the ancient Greeks, of whom he's a direct inheritor. Among his many wonderful, inspiring books, let me just out outline one of his last, Humanism, Love and Music, in English 2011, originally published in German in 2000. The book is available also in French and in Spanish, and also in Greek, Floros' own native language. Moreover, a Polish and a Russian version are forthcoming. This is arguably Floros' most philosophical book, where he displays his humanist equipment in the most overt fashion. I quote from the preface. I have devoted myself to emphasize music's humane dimension, to bespeak fundamental issues, to indicate criteria, reference points, to sketch some evolution tendencies, to examine music at close distance as a language of love, and to highlight the details of different conceptions of love in the music of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries through case studies, so to speak, end of quote. Still in this splendid preface about his own method of semantic analysis, Floros reminds the reader of Robert Coutius's idea in the first half of the 20th century that the progress of historic sciences will take place where specializing and a global approach will combine and interpenetrate each other. Such an old idea, it's so new, so current. Robert Curtius, and then Floros. Floros concludes this quote of Curtius by stating that this motto has guided the whole of his own musicological research. Just how interdisciplinary, nowadays a trendy word, interdisciplinary, how interdisciplinary Floros' work has always been can be easily seen in the bibliography at the end of this volume, divided in categories such as philosophical works, art history, literary studies, psychological studies, and of course, musicological studies. The intellectual ambition of Floros's work can also be measured at the book's table of contents. The starting point could not be more radical. He asks himself, what is music? Then about music's powers, then about the main affects, love and hatred, joy and melancholy, as they manifest musically. Next, he dedicates a whole second part of the book to the topic music as a language of love, 
to close with a decidedly political epilogue. In this epilogue, Floros's philosophical enterprise culminates in a critical analysis of our contemporary world. He does not shy away from delicate matters, such as the dangers of a dehumanization of music and of our life in general. And let me close with this very point. Floros seems to share with a number of researchers and intellectuals a disappointed look on our present times. This is due to his desperate love for his Europe of humanism, the disintegration of which Stefan Zweig or George Steiner bemoan. Floros knows this humanist Europe as very few people of our time. And he sees how many in the next generation lack the time and maybe the interest in sitting down to study Latin and Greek, Dante's Commedia, Gavafis' poems, Chekhov's stories, or Don Quixote. And yes, agreed, we are confronted to this loss every day at colleges. But from my point of view, Professor Floros's books are a highly efficient contribution to the nurturing of this humanist culture that has made us who we are, whether we are aware of it or not. And this humanism needs a constant new translation that appeals to the new generations in their own terms, not in ours. So, Efaristo Parapoli, Cathedral Floro, for your great efforts. It is wonderful to have you here somehow, even if only online. Your work is blooming already in your students and in your students' students, and it will continue to bloom in the next future. And thank you all for your kind attention. Coffee break. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. There's uh, still time for some, uh, yes. We have uh, time for um, two questions or comments. Sorry, sorry. Yes. You first, all right. uh, so, uh, thank you very much for all this fascinating talk, especially uh, for Professor Floros for this very uh, pro probing essay. And it, uh, problem hit me that, that he mentioned uh, this problem of the figure of the composer and how it is uh, how dissimilar to to the problem of the author of authorship uh, in literary studies, which is like one of the biggest debates in, in literary studies. I, I, I can say, say I, as the, um, I teach literary theory, so it's like uh, it's actually one of the one of the biggest debates in, in, in literary studies. Uh, so I wanted actually wanted to ask actually. Uh, that it seems quite obvious how these two problems are uh, similar, but I wanted to ask how these are different because, like, uh, if if it's true that we perceive music rather differently than literature, like for many obvious reasons that they, they these two media are, are different in many means, uh, then it should be some dif so this difference as well uh, between uh, how we perceive or how we imagine or how we access. Uh, the, uh, the figure of the composer and the figure of the author in, uh, in music and, and in literature. So, the, in your opinion, what these differences might be? I take this one. No, then me also, but okay. we'll be <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, wonderful question. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Yes, um, it happens so, um, that uh, Raymond Monell is my, my other beloved teacher. Um, next to Floros, and uh, uh, he um, he translated all this um, French um, 
postmodernist thought of uh, the, the death of the author and so, and so on into music and declared that uh, Gustav was not the, the, the issue, but his music. Yeah, but it's all. And so um, I, I have uh, seen both views and I have learned a lot from both views. Floros um, believes a lot and, and takes a lot of profit from biographical information. Um, and, and Monel also, in his own way, leaving this biographical part aside. So um, I, I've learned from both. Thank you very much. Uh, you touched a very essential question because it's certainly a very original idea nowadays to speak music as autobiography because uh, the whole uh, humanistic studies in the 20th century has been by all means, um, try to diminish the role of the, the, of, the, of the writer and composer. So we have maybe best known is a theory of the implied author and real author. So Mahler as a real physical person is different from the Mahler as, as an implied author uh, who is there. So that the hero of his symphonies uh, in his uh, musical actor themes is not Mahler himself somehow. Of course, there is some kind of link, absolutely, but what it is is rather mysterious, but, uh, but um, the whole narrative theory is emphasizing that, uh, that um, symphony is its um, it own whole. But, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, there is a certain point in, in Flores' idea that uh, we, we bring the humanism back to, uh, even to, to music. So that, uh, like uh, one of my colleagues in Finland, Professor McKinnon, said that uh, music is speech of man to a man or speech of woman to a woman. <laughs> that's, so that, uh, that's the, the origin of any musical expression. Thank you. And uh, as a third answer or you know, attempt at answering your question, uh, there is an issue specifically uh, with 19th century orchestral music and specifically with Mahler, this program music question, which I believe uh, makes a difference between uh, you know, the composer and the, the death of composer and or the death of, of, of the author. Because a program, the written program, written explanation uh, authorized by the composer uh, uh, himself as a paratext uh, uh, creates a very specific situation which uh, cannot be really compared to situation in, in literature because in, if in literature you have a similar paratext, uh, the, the channel of communication is the same, namely language, but in the case of, of music, you, you have the music itself and something said by words, and, and it is a big question or, or, or problem to, to resolve what uh, you do with these uh, texts, with these programs. And uh, the answer by Professor Flores, and in, in the third volume of, of the trilogy, is to, to take programs as seriously as possible, and if there is any existing program for a Mahler symphony, then, then he takes it as, as the, the fundament, or at least as the starting point of, of his uh, um, um, interpretation of, of, the, of the work itself. But of course, you can treat this issue in, in uh, other ways as well. But the problem itself, I believe, uh, uh, defines the difference between author and composer, in, in, uh, as you asked. Um, question, um, Daniel. Yes, sorry, yes. Uh, yes, of course, yes. Initially, I wanted to comment on something completely different. But uh, tapping into this discussion, I'll say something which is actually very controversial. But uh, this relationship between uh, the experience of, of the composer and then uh, the work that he or she actually creates, and uh, finally uh, the recipient, the, the one who uh, perceives, who receives that music. We could go back to, you know, uh, Maturana and Varela and their concept of autopoiesis. Uh, it originated in biology, but they, I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but they somehow from that tried to build a whole theory of a human cognition. Now, very controversial, Nicholas Luhmann, in his theory of social systems, 
try to uh, sort of import this idea. Basically, uh, something in your life will trigger something. I'm, I'm trying to simplify it greatly, and there's no time for, for any more elaborate discussion, but what exactly would that trigger is something only up to your constitution. What your work ex will exactly trigger in the recipient is again up to the recipient. There is no message that is transferred from the sender to the receiver. Uh, actually, the whole communication is autopoietic and uh, it goes through structural coupling. That's the, that's the idea that is uh, originated with Maturana and Varela and then Luhmann used it in, for, for his um, social studies. So actually, it's more like mutual irritability. Uh, art needs to irritate us. But what is really, what is, is, is going to produce in our mind, in our psyche, is something which is very hard to disentangle. This is very... Oops. Can you hear? Okay. Very, very exciting so, to bring these um, very different um, uh, theoretical schools uh, of the, which you mentioned and this cognition. But, but, but certainly, of course, this is linked with the whole issue of intentional fallacy, namely, namely that what the uh, writer or composer intended is not at, at all the same with what, what the receiver receives. So like that's, even Johann Wolfgang Goethe said to his secretary that the people had found in my Faust completely different things which I, I ever thought about that. And he accepted the truth. So, so the, once the work has been written, then it uh, starts its autonomous life and, and it can be received in by whatsoever manner. But you said that um, art must be irritated. So I think it can only irritate if somehow it, it concerns, the, uh, concerns the, the receiver. So that there must be some kind of forverständnis, uh, for, for for uh, um, common forverständnis between, between or isotopy. <laughs> or whatsoever uh, behind, or epistemic uh, category behind, which, which li is linking the composer and the receiver and listener. So otherwise, um, music could not irritate in any way. It would be just sound. So it's... it's uh, humanity. humanity, yes. We, we all participate yes, yes. in the hum common humanity, so... Yes, that's, that's very, very deep. Particularly in this deepest archaic lay layers of our psyche. This yes. unconscious, which is pretty much universal. Yes, uh, unconscious. And music uh, very uh, much taps into that. Our colleague is studying Freud and uh, uncanny, so that you, you might let me answer to this unconscious question. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we have to interrupt this um, interesting conversation here. Otherwise, somebody else would eat, would eat all the cakes away. <laughs> so, thanks a lot for this. Yes, okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.